Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Dallas, Texas. It's great to have you. Welcome to the Windspear Opera House. Um, opera, I hope you believe it's uh, as beautiful as we think it is. Opera Magazine uh, named it the best opera house in America. They did it because uh, they believed that we took the, the traditional opera house and really reimagined it for the 21st century. I think it's an apropos setting for this meeting. We are proud to be the first U.S. city and the third city worldwide to host this important event. Thank you, John, for chairing the New Cities Foundation for bringing it here. Thank you, Mathieu Lefebvre, for the executive director of the New Cities Foundation. You'll meet him. And thank you to Max Anderson, uh, the director of the Dallas Museum of Art. Thank you to the many sponsors. We called many of you and asked to step up. I appreciate that. Uh, and I uh, think you are going to enjoy uh, these sessions. This is a mix of people, some from Dallas, and visitors from now 51 countries around the world. Now, those of you that are from Dallas, you have a job. Your job is to be very friendly and very hospitable. We want to say welcome, we need to smile, and we need to uh, ask people to come back. Now, those of you that are visiting, your main job is to spend lots of money while you're here. <laughs> it's an extraordinary honor for me to be mayor of this great city during what I believe is a time of prosperity unlike Dallas has ever seen before. The city of Dallas, let me just give you a sense, is now part of the Dallas-Fort Worth area which now boasts a population of over 6.8 million residents, making it the fourth largest metropolitan area in the United States. So you have the New York area, Los Angeles area, Chicagoland, and Dallas-Fort Worth. We do it with a lot of cooperation. In fact, I'd like to introduce my partner, the mayor of Fort Worth, Betsy Price. Is Betsy here? Let's give her a big hand. There she is, right there. Now, we live in the second most populous state in the United States, with Texas um, on its way to a 27 million inhabitants. We're the fastest growing state, we're the, we're the fastest growing region for jobs. To put those numbers in perspective, the DFW metro area has more people than the city of Rio, and Texas has more people than the country of Australia. So how did we get this way? How do we grow and how do we look towards the future? Well, there's a story that was important to me. Three years ago, I, I met privately with Spanish architect Santiago Calatrava, who was in town to celebrate the opening of a bridge he designed that has become now part of our famous skyline. I encourage you to visit the bridge while you're here, which is named the Margaret Hunt Hill Bridge and serves as the gateway to West Dallas, building, uh, bridging a gap between two parts of the city, not only in a beautiful way, but functionally and symbolically for the city of Dallas. I also recommend you to walk on the parallel continental bridge that we've turned into a park, so to speak, and bike along Trinity Skyline Trail, both of, you, uh, both of which we just opened on Sunday. I was in awe of Mr. Calatrava, not only for his architectural prowess, but also because he was so well-traveled, respected, urbane, well-known throughout the world. He's lived in great cities like Paris, Valencia, and New York. As we discussed the impressions of Dallas, I felt the need to explain and be a little defensive that it wouldn't be fair to compare our city to others across the globe that had been around for centuries because we're still so young. We're a new city. That's when he told me something that, that had a tremendous impact on how I viewed Dallas and how I viewed my job. He said, aha, that's the great news. What you're doing now will last for centuries. His message, there's always gonna be someone that's around longer, 
but the spirit we must all embrace is constantly reimagining ourselves. As I thought more about what he said, I realized that Dallas had been built on reimagining itself, making our city the perfect fit for this year's summit theme of reimagining cities. A city is more than bricks and mortars, it's made up of people. The reimagining story is a story about the people. One of these people was a traveler from Arkansas, a lawyer named John Neely Bryan, who reimagined Dallas as a permanent settlement after first surveying the area near downtown in 1839 to establish a trading post. Well, the trading post would have served Native Americans and settlers, but when Dallas returned in 18, uh, when Bryan returned in 1841, a treaty had been signed and all the Native Americans left. So the majority of his potential trade partners had vanished. Shortly after Neely had established Dallas as a permanent, set as a permanent settlement, a group of 350 French, Belgian, Swiss colonists sought to reimagine Dallas as a socialist utopian, a community called La Reunion. But just one year after the European colonists had created La Reunion, a blizzard and a drought of 1856 destroyed the majority of their crops, causing many of them to go back home to Europe and move out of the area. What little was left of La Reunion was incorporated into Dallas in 1860 when local leaders begin to reimagine the city now as a transportation hub. You can start to see how challenges we all face create the need for reimagination. As they say, necessity is the mother of invention. Because Dallas is not located in a major waterway, we have no port, we have no raison d'etre in many ways. It became imperative that it connects the railroads, though, in order to, to move that transportation. By the end of the decade, the state's major north-south railroad, the Houston and Texas Central Railroad, was connected to Dallas. And just a few years later, by the cleverness of a state legislature that put a small print in a bill, compelled the state's major east-west railroad, the Texas and Pacific Railway, to run through Dallas, firmly establishing the city as a trade and transportation hub and a commercial center. The arrival of the Missouri-Kansas Texas Railroad soon followed and the city's population reached more than 10,000 by 1880. The arrival of trains led to new buildings and businesses popped up on a daily basis and da Dallas quickly became an epicenter for raw materials and crops like grains and cotton. Dallas then reimagined itself in Texas as of all things a tourist destination in the late 1880s by hosting the first state fair of Texas, which is now the largest state fair in the United States. For those of you in Sao Paulo last year, I spoke about this is the home of every great fried food you can imagine. <laughs> we opened the first zoological garden in the state and realized quality of life was important. During that same period, the city has been reimagined as the world's leading manufacturer of saddlery and cotton gin machinery. Shortly thereafter, realizing that size and scale were important, Dallas reimagined itself as a much larger city, annexing East Dallas in 1890 and the city of Oak Cliff, which was in the south, in 1903. So because of its leadership in the state, business climate, size, Dallas was chosen in 1911 as the location of the 11th regional branch of the Federal Reserve Bank. This played an important role in the city becoming reimagined over the next couple of decades as a center of banking now, of insurance, of fashion, of fashion retailing, highlighted by the world famous Neiman Marcus, which remains a fixture in downtown. Stanley Marcus reimagined his store as bringing a bit of Paris fashion to the money of Texas. He did just that. 
By the 1930s, several prominent skyscrapers had been built downtown, and Dallas established itself as a business capital of the Southwest. The city weathered a Great Depression better than most cities throughout the country because of broad economic success, flourishing construction, and the oil boom, with Dallas serving as the financial center for the majority of the oil fields in Texas and Oklahoma. Dallas served as a manufacturing center in World War II and saw employment grow by 44% in the 1950s. Median family income skyrocketed by 70% and the city's population grew to around 680,000. The creation of the interstate highway system in America allowed Dallas to continue its role as a major trade and transportation hub, but the city reimagined itself as Dallas became the nation's third largest technology center throughout the 1950s and 60s. Leading the way was the substantial growth of companies like LTV Corporation and Texas Instruments, which produced the world's first commercial sil silicon transistor, the first integrated circuit-based computer, and the first handheld calculator. Tragedy struck in 1963 when President John F. Kennedy was assassinated just a mile or so away from where we sit, putting us on the world stage now but for the wrong reason, as suddenly we were thought as a hateful city. Dallas was able to rebound thanks to tremendous leadership by Texas Instruments CEO, co-founder Eric Johnson, who had moved his company, reimagined himself from New Jersey to Dallas. He was elected mayor just two months after the tragedy. Mayor Johnson reimagined the city by introducing an innovative plan called Goals for Dallas, which became a Harvard case study at the Kennedy School of Government. He also helped secure funding and support that led to the creation of the current city hall, central library buildings, along with Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport which is jointly owned between the city of Dallas and the city of Fort Worth. Opened in 1974, it's now one of the largest and busiest airports in the world. The airport, and this is no lie, is bigger than the island of Manhattan. They thought big. In 1980, the city's population reached 900,000 and Dallas continued to prosper even as the majority of the oil industry relocated to Houston. The city benefited from growing computer and telecom industry and continued to serve as a major inland port and a center for banking and business. Now Dallas leaders realized then that all this growth was going to create major traffic congestion. So the city reimagined itself as a leader in public transportation in 1983 when it helped create Dallas Area Rapid Transit, DART, which has become the largest light rail system in the United States. Dallas's economy was nearly destroyed in the mid to late 1980s by the burst of the real estate bubble, something we all need to look out for, and took another hit in the early 2000s after the burst of the dot-com bubble. Signs of the economic turnaround began to appear in 2004, setting the stage for a decade of unprecedented growth for the city, even as the country suffered through the Great Recession. We went into the recession later and got out of it earlier than anybody else. In the past 10 years, we have reimagined our city in countless ways in an effort to improve the quality of life for our 1.2 million citizens. We now are trying to avoid reacting to crisis as they appear and instead be more proactive and strategic as we look at issues like transportation, commerce, social consciousness, and arts and culture through the 21st century lens. We realized that we had allowed the large amount of space in and around Dallas to work against us it created sprawl and leading to a new focus on reimagining our city in an urban context. We also realize that accomplishing that goal is not only about commerce and money, 
The inspiration for life we all receive from the arts is just as important. Throughout this the summit, you will be able to enjoy one of the greatest recent achievements that has helped us reimagine Dallas as a city known throughout the world for its dedication and passion for the arts. The AT&T Performing Arts Center, which includes the Windspear Opera House and the Wiley Theater, the addition of these venues to an area that already include the Dallas Museum of Art, Meyerson Symphony Center, the Nasher Sculpture Center, has given us the late largest urban arts district in the United States. Combined with our new Perot Museum of Nature and Science, which topped more than a million visitors less than eight months ago, just down the road in 2012 it opened, we now have five buildings designed by Pritzker Prize winning architects, spanning 68 acres and 19 contiguous blocks. Our participation in the Global Cultural Districts Network, which you'll be hearing about over the next couple of days, fosters cooperation, knowledge, sharing among entities that are involved with cultural arts districts around the globe. It's something we're proud to participate in. Our city has also reimagined the way we address the revitalization of our downtown by focusing on adding green space. Green space, green space. Three new downtown parks, Clyde Warren Park, Main Street Garden, and Below Garden have encouraged more people to visit and live downtown than ever before. And we have also embraced that two-wheeled vehicle, the bicycle. Unlike before, in the addition to trails throughout the city, bike lanes on our streets, and plans to establish bike rental and bike share programs. A real moment of maturation for our city was when we reimagined how we assist those that are less fortunate. For decades, Dallas had simply ignored the issue or focused on creating laws that would cause the homeless to hide from public view. But now we've embraced our responsibility to help our city's most destitute residents with a new homeless recovery center called The Bridge, which has significantly reduced crime and the level of chronically homeless population. Long known as a city who loves our cars and trucks, Dallas has reimagined itself as a walkable city by promoting density, mixed-use development, and complete streets. We also have been focused on strengthening neighborhoods, embracing technology, and making huge strides in becoming a greener city. Dallas has reduced emissions, implemented an award-winning cutting-edge green code, and became the first major U.S. city to achieve 9001 registration from the International um, Organization for Standardization for an entire city department. Our city, in fact, we are all cities that are young in one way or the other, as I look around this room. But our city is young. We have turned just 158 years old. But as you've heard, we've grown up a lot, especially in the last decade. Yet we face major, major issues if we want to continue to grow. Our next two biggest obstacles are education and poverty. The gap between the haves and the have-nots is too significant, not only economically, not only in regards to education, but the expectation of our citizens. We must close that gap. But we as a city and community leaders cannot reimagine our cities by reacting anymore. And we can't just reimagine our cities by coming up with cool ideas after a bottle of wine. We must be more strategic. We must be clear in our objectives. We must believe in the art of the possible. We must not give in to the either or political argument and instead embrace the and in our dilemmas. We must not move from one political extreme to another because these plans take much time 
and provide us with a better opportunity for success if we're long-term oriented. I look forward to hearing your ideas in the coming days about what your cities are doing to address those critical issues like poverty, education, transportation, and many others. Thank you so much for attending this conference and for being here. I hope you all make time in your busy schedule to experience all the great things in our city. And most importantly, remember to spend that money. Thank you very much. Thank you.